Mike Bond joined now by a PFL commentator, analyst, uh, one of the faces of the organization, Kenny Florian. Uh, Kenny, we are gearing up for another year of PFL, Challengers Series starting soon. Um, I guess just give me your thoughts on what we're looking forward to before we get to the actual season again. Yeah, Mike, thanks, man. Um, yeah, I I'm really looking forward to it. You know, obviously we have the Challengers Series coming up. It's going to be on FUBU uh, TV and uh, FUBO TV, sorry. And, uh, yeah, just re really excited to see what kind of talent, um, you know, the PFL uh, can find. Obviously, we had Delano Taylor last year that went all the way to the final. Uh, so I, I think it's been a great outlet to find up-and-coming talent uh, globally, which is super cool. Yeah, and, I mean, you said it right there, like – I mean, it's hard these days to find like prospects, right? Like they get sweeped up very quickly by all these different organizations. So like that they can find some diamonds in the rough like that, that can go all the way. Um, I guess that shows like the degree in which the PFL is able to scout, scout talent for things like this. No question about it. I think that if we tried to do this maybe 10, 15 years ago, yeah, sure. You, you know, you'd have to scrap and, and, and still fight for other talent but it's just a completely different environment now there's so many gyms there's so many different fight promotions out there you know some of the local or regional uh fight organizations that we're seeing better and better talent all the time now mixed martial arts has exploded all over the world so it, th there's just more talent available so uh it's exciting time yeah, and I mean, what do you think adding the, like this Challenger series kind of shows about the growth of PFL, like that they're adding more layers beyond just the season? And, you know, obviously we can get into the pay-per-view division and stuff they have plans for as well, but uh, it just seems like every year it's just growing, growing, growing. Mike, the, the thing that stands out the most to me is that the PFL is committed uh, not only to finding the best fighters in the world, but they're also committed to the long-term growth of the sport. Uh, they want to have you know, loads of talent to choose from for the season. Uh, and a Challenger Series so far has proven to be a, a great way to do that. So uh, excited to be a part of it. I think there's going to be some great talent this year. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, man. It, it all starts this week. Yeah, and I know um, multiple cards and competitors have been announced and stuff like that. Uh, through your early research, is there anyone that sticks out to you that you're like, damn, I can't wait for this guy to compete? You know, of course, there's Shane Burgos. I'm really curious to see, um, you know, how he performs this season. I think the most challenging thing for fighters is the fact that, you know, you have four fights in like eight or nine months. That That, that is a grueling schedule. For some fighters, it might even be more, right, with the Challenger Series uh, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I think managing your training, even when I look at it from, from a fighter's perspective, uh, I don't know exactly know how I would approach that. It, it, it's a very tricky thing. You have to be able to train the proper amount. You can't go too crazy camp to camp. You also can't uh, take too much time off. Obviously, you got to make weight. You got to stay in shape. You got to be sharp for each and every fight. So managing the pacing, I think, for the training camps is probably the most difficult part. So i um, curious to see how he, uh, how Shane uh, prepares for that. But that, there's there's a ton of talent coming up. Um, that are excited to see and, and maybe some other fighters that uh, have yet to be signed. So uh, still early. Yeah. And seeing this journey of, you know, fighters go through the season multiple times over. And as you said, there, the difficulty of it, especially trying to do like repeat championships and things like that. Uh, what do you think you've kind of learned about this process uh, from the fighter side and kind of what they have to go through? You touched on a little bit there, but um, if you could elaborate, I guess a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. You know, it, it really, it's kind of the, the management of the training camps themselves, you know, managing the intensity of it and also the management of injuries, you know, having good people around you, coaches and cornermen uh, that are going to tell you to do the right thing. Sometimes we do a lot of silly hard work that is unnecessary, like, you know, crazy amounts of sparring or overdoing it with the strength and conditioning. Your body can only take so much and everybody is different so knowing your fighter and knowing how much they can take uh and how much they can sustain throughout the season i think is the biggest challenge out there do you look at it and never like kind of compare it to the ultimate fighter process you went through and kind of obviously a, a lot of differences but some similarities as well no question about it i, I think that you know when, when when i started i was on the show for two months uh which, which was really really difficult uh you know, you're kind of shut off from, from uh, the outside world. 
Uh, and then, of course, you have that finale where, uh, you know, you need to be able to perform. So, yeah, it, it, definitely some similarities. I do like the Challenger series, um, you know, because it's just one night, you know, you show up one night and that's it. You don't have to stay in the house, all that stuff. But, um, yeah, I like I like this format a lot. I think the other thing about the PFL, which is really interesting, which is going to get fighters thinking if, they, if they're not thinking about it already, is the time and effort that they invest into their training, into their fights. You know, if you are a, you know, a guy that's in the top 10 or wanting to get into the top 10, you're either with the UFC or about to sign with a bigger promotion, if you're doing the math, you're going, wait a sec, I can fight in the UFC for several years and never total a million dollars. I, I could be, you know, kind of this hotshot prospect, go into the PFL, and in a year or two, I could have a legitimate shot at winning a million dollars. You know, I, I think that that says a lot. You know, when you're talking about maximizing your career and doing the best with what you're given, I think PFL is going to be a much more viable option. It is going to entice way more fighters that are on the brink or about to either re-sign or looking to sign uh, with the big promotion. You know, especially, you know, maybe some of those guys that, you know, top three, four, five, never were able to get a belt. Maybe they challenged for the belt. Maybe a similar situation to me where they challenged for the belt two or, or three times, weren't able to get it. Um, going to the PFL, you can make that money and be a world champion as well. So I think it's going to be an interesting option as people really start to think about, you know, the economic incentive. Yeah, and obviously you kind of said it there. Uh, you accomplished a lot in your own career, fought for multiple UFC titles, things like that. Um, when you look at you know the paydays now for something like PFL, like do you kind of kick yourself and be like, damn, I was just in the wrong era, or like do you you know is there some envy, some jealousy, or do you feel like uh, for what you did in your time, uh, you were pretty well taken care of? Oh, you know, I, I felt like I, w I was uh, pretty well taken care of, you know, especially as I established myself. Um, but, uh, of course I, I, I would have loved to have made more money. You know, I think that's always, uh, you know, always the thing for fighters. I think it's a great time to be a professional fighter right now. You have great options. You have organizations like the PFL that are really doing their best to not only pay you out, you know, what, what you deserve as a professional fighter, uh, but they're invested in you. And also it allows the fighter uh, to really uh, have more of his more of their destiny in their own hands. It's not one of these things like, hey, we're going to give you the shot because you're very popular with this, or you give great interviews, or you know you're a hot shot in your country. None of that matters. If you win, you advance. Period. So if you do what you're supposed to be doing, you can go ahead, be a world champion, and be be a millionaire. You know how many times have we have we seen a guy who was so close to getting that shot? and never was able to get it because someone else jumped in front of the line or, you know, whatever this and that happened politically, all these things, it, it, you know, it truly is much more of a meritocracy over in the PFL. So I think that's another, um, you know, big motive uh, for, for fighters who are, are looking to sign with another organization. Yeah. And things are evolving a little bit in that regard, obviously, you know, the pay-per-view division I mentioned, it seems like things yeah. are going to be a little bit different. Do you feel like this is, uh, you know, the right steps for PFL to be taking and kind of going into th this type of business and changing it a little bit? Or do you think they're straying too far from the identity that people know it as? You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think that the PFL in a lot of ways are, you know, really willing to put themselves out there. You know, I, I think uh, the UFC, other organizations are really trying to manage things from a perspective of, can we maintain this for our 600 plus fighters? The PFL is willing to go, let's see if this works. We're going to go out there and offer 50% of the pay-per-view revenue to these fighters. There's no one else that's doing that. Now, that can hurt the PFL financially in some ways. I hope it doesn't, um, and I don't think it will. But, I mean, that, that is a huge incentive uh, for fighters to make it to that level, to be involved with the super fight division. And obviously bringing in Jake Paul and having his promotional backing and his following uh, behind there, I think, is, is an interesting twist to that as well. So um, I think that uh, there's very few companies and organizations, especially fight organizations, that are willing to go out there and do that for the fighters and say, we're going to take a risk. I know you guys are looking for more money. Well, let, let's, let's see what you guys do with this. Let's see what we can do uh, to help the sport, help the promotion, and help the fighters 
uh, to make this the, the, the biggest uh, promotion we can. Yeah, I'm super interested to see how this all unfolds going forward. And you mentioned his name right there. Uh, would be remiss if we didn't bring it up. Jake Paul, the relationship that's happening here. Um, you know, it seems like he'll be able to use, you know, his reach and his social media influence to do a lot for the exposure and the brand of the company. But as far as the actual potential of him fighting, which it seems like this is what they ultimately want to trend towards. Uh, what do you make of this? I mean, are you confident he's going to get in there? Um, how do you think it should be handled from a matchmaking perspective? There's a lot of layers to the potential Jake Paul MMA crossover. You know, candidly, I really wasn't the, the, the biggest Jake Paul fan. You know, when he was doing the boxing thing, I was like, ah, here's this guy. He's, you know, trying to take advantage of, of a situation here. And he's going to fight once and, you know, we're, he's going to lose. And we're never going to see this guy again. Uh, and lo and behold, he's, you know, continued to have boxing fights. He's undefeated. Uh, in boxing, uh, making a ton of money. Now, I know he, there's other things he can do. He, he's making a ton of money regardless. He's already, uh, you know, a multimillionaire. This isn't, you know, the easiest way to make money. And for that, he has my respect because he has continued to do this and now talking about entering into a mixed martial arts contest, which is, again, another beast altogether, right? So, uh, you know, he, he definitely has uh, my respect for wanting to do that being a part of it, trying to call out, you know, other promotions, other fighters, all these things to try to uh, make it, um, you know, a, a bigger event and to help the fighters themselves to, to get the money that, uh, you know, I think we all think they deserve, you know. So um, I'm interested to see how, how it all goes down. Do you think this Nate Diaz thing could happen? I mean, I know he mentioned, you know, let's do one boxing fight and then an MMA fight later. Um, if it did come to fruition, I mean, in my perspective the boxing fight on paper should be a lot more competitive than the mma fight um yeah. is, that, is that a bad idea for jake to try to fight someone of nate diaz's caliber and accomplishments in his first mma fight you know certainly nate has has done a lot in the sport he's an amazing fighter with uh you know legendary heart and determination and, and of course he's got a lot of skills i think it'd be a tall task you know wh whether you're talking about boxing or mixed martial arts nate diaz is a problem um even though he's been fighting for a long time uh but i think uh jake has done a great job of picking the right fights and the right fighters uh, up in this standpoint um and i, I mean I, i'd be curious to see how it goes down jake is a dangerous dude you know if he hits you uh you could be in trouble he's a big guy uh, i actually did a seminar not too long ago at westlake high school in ohio and up on the rafters up on the wall were a couple banners for both him and his brother for winning wrestling titles. So I think it was a sectional title and then, you know, entry into the state uh, wrestling championships in Ohio, which is no joke for wrestling. So, yeah, I mean, uh, he's obviously a great athlete and a big kid, big, strong kid, uh, you know, who's been backing up a lot of this trash talk. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm myself, I'm waiting for some kind of mixed martial arts fighter to go in there and, and, and shut him up sometimes, you know? So, uh, it, it's interesting times, man. Crazy times. Anything and everything can happen. So I, I don't write anything off these days. Yeah. What do you think would be the best play, though? Like, say the Nate Diaz thing doesn't come to fruition and he just comes and wants to have, you know, an MMA fight with PFL. Mm. Um, what do you think is the best path to, like, kind of use him? Do you put him in there against a guy with some name and, like, some experience? Because it's like, okay, this is the biggest selling fight we can make. And maybe the odds are, you know, not necessarily in Jake's favor. Or do you find someone who's, you know, maybe on a similar skill level who no one really knows, but you feel like he can win this fight. Right. I, I don't know. You know, I, I think that it's intriguing, uh, you know, that he's going after Nate Diaz because potentially maybe he, he goes out there and says, we do a boxing fight and then we do a mixed martial arts fight. Now it gets a little bit more complicated as, as you try to tie those two things together. Uh, but I would assume it's someone who's going to be willing to do both. In my head, anyway, I see that as the most intriguing thing. It's like, hey, you fight me in you fight me in boxing, and then we'll do it in mixed martial arts. Um, so m maybe that's Nate Diaz. Maybe uh, it's it's someone completely different. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's a Vitor Belfort uh, fight in boxing, and then he fights maybe a, a Tyron Woodley uh, in a mixed martial arts fight. You know, they did it twice. Uh, in boxing, he has two wins over Tyron. I don't know, Tyron's kind of been in and around the PFL for a little bit, poking around, and I'm sure he would love a chance in a mixed martial arts setting against Jake Paul. The cool thing is there are a ton of options out there uh, to, to make that happen. So, uh, 
yeah, I, I, again, I, I'm really curious to see uh, what happens um, in, in, in this year and, and in 2024. Yeah, and another kind of big name who's lingering out there who doesn't yet have like a contractual attachment to the PFL, but is available is Francis Ngannou. And I know yeah. they like put out some tweets of being like, hey, you know, basically showing interest like, you know, everyone out there is. Um, if they could somehow get a, a deal done, what do you think would be the best way for PFL to use Francis? I mean, obviously, I, you would imagine the money he'd be commanding, he'd be in the pay-per-view division. But like, do you try to bring someone else out who has a name? Do you try to put, you know, your heavyweight champion in there against him right away? Like, what, what do you think would be the best way to handle Francis if he came on a board? Good question, man. Um, I think, especially him coming off of knee surgery uh, and potentially – doing this big boxing fight like with Tyson Fury, you know, they've been talking about. Um, I think that putting him in the super fight division would probably make the most amount of sense. Him fighting who ends up, you know, whoever ends up being the champion uh, for the PFL, I think would be really intriguing. I tell you what, as far as the heavyweight division, we, we might not have the same depth as the UFC, right, uh, in the heavyweight division, but I think – are, are like the top three or four guys in the PFL. I think they can hang with a lot of the top three or four guys in the UFC. No question about it. I think a lot of our heavy, heavyweights, whether we're talking about Ate Delia or Bruno Capoloza, you know, we have a ton of talent in the PFL in the heavyweight division. And I think there's a lot of intriguing matchups uh, and potential for them against Francis Ngannou. And, you know, who knows? I, I think signing Francis Ngannou would be massive not only for the pfl but for the sport and it's going to get fighters to scratch their heads and going hmm, maybe i can go over there and it and it, and it i think it would it would allow the pfl to get a ton of respect and uh eventually get even more great fighters yeah, it would be a game-changing move for them. And uh, I know we only have a few minutes left here, so I want to kind of do some rapid-ish fire with you, Kenny. Sure. I'm going to uh, give you, you know, either a name, uh, you know, a promotion name or like a fill-in-the-blank, and you just give me the first thought that comes to mind. Keep it short, long, whatever you want to do, given cool. uh, what it's off. So number one, Kayla Harrison. Kayla uh, has an opportunity to come back from adversity again, and, um, you know, to establish herself as, as one of the greatest of all time. I would love to see uh, her and Larissa go at it again. John Anik. John Anik. He is the man. Hardest working guy in MMA and uh, one, one of the most talented broadcasters out there right now in any sport. Slap fighting. I hate it. I, uh, no, no defense. If you can't defend yourself, I'm out, man. I don't want to see any of that. I think it's, uh, I think it's horrible. Yeah, you think this this kind of season, given the ratings and the feedback, is hopefully a one and done? Yeah, I, I hope so. Like, I, I don't cheer against uh, things necessarily, but it's not something I'm interested in or, or want to watch or, or, or really want to support. Fair enough. A uh, little bit of a more depressing one, Stefan Bonner. Uh, sad. Uh, I was really sad to hear that news. Uh, Stefan was one of the funniest uh, guys, one of the most charismatic guys I've ever met. Uh, a warrior through and through. Um, and, and my heart broke when I heard that news. Man. Absolutely. A uh, big loss for the MMA community. Um, Jose Aldo. One of the greatest of all time. Uh, an innovator, a champion, uh, one of the most consistent fighters in the world, one of the most skilled fighters in the world. What he has accomplished is absolutely inspiring, and it was truly an honor to fight someone like that. And last one, it's kind of a fill in the blank here. PFL fighter most likely to repeat as champion in 2023 is? Ooh, geez, that's a tough one. Coming off of last year, um, I guess I'd have to go with Ante Delia. Yeah, that's a yeah. good one. For sure. Yeah. It's tricky. There's, I th I've got, I somewhat stumped you on that one. It was a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a dumb one. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, that's all of them, Kenny. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. It was great to chat with you and catch up. It's been a little while. So uh, I'm glad to see you're killing it and you're doing your thing over there. It's always great to see you on the broadcast. And I think you guys do an amazing job. So uh, best of luck, you know, just keeping the train rolling. Really appreciate it, Mike. Take care, man.